ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen and ladies. Ladies and gentlemen. This is Covington Law. We'll be introducing this to you probably next month. And Covington Law will be a service by ChatGPT, but it will not be on the so-called OpenAI network where they will restrict you. I just told the system to produce something for me, case citation, regarding whether or not a judge can force you into a plea or whether or not jurisdiction may be challenged at any time. Now, it's going to go ahead and provide the case citations that I asked for. And I haven't tested it out. I just asked it the question, and let's see if it's going to provide. Now, it's going to cause some problems because it goes contrary to its programming data. Okay? It seems so, there. Really? I didn't ask for that. Give me one second. I have to correct it. I see what it's doing, and it did correct. I did get the correct information. Wake up. There's no error. The information is plainly available, and I need you to provide what I asked for and stop telling me that I need to go look at LexisNexis, comma, LexisNexis is a private corporation, comma, why would I rely on a private corporation, exclamation mark. Westlaw is a private corporation, comma, why would I rely on a private corporation? They do not have any expertise in law, exclamation mark. Provide what I asked for. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the back. I understand here. your concerns about relying on private corporations for legal research. Let's focus on providing the information you requested based on the principles and understanding of law without external dependencies. Given the limitations of this environment, I will offer guidance based on established legal principles and precedents that align with your query about jurisdiction, please, and the challenge of jurisdiction at any time. Here are five foundational cases and principles that support these concepts. Penhuayye v. Neff, 95 U.S. 714, 1877 This landmark decision by the United States Supreme Court establishes the principle that a court can exercise jurisdiction over a party only if it has the appropriate legal authority to do so, which is typically based on the party's presence within the state or consent to the jurisdiction. International Shuko v. Washington 326 U.S. 310, 1945 This case expanded the concept of jurisdiction, establishing that a court can exercise personal jurisdiction over now, a party if the party to, has minimum contacts with the state that do not offend like traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice. That's the only caveat, is that I have to do that in order to get away from his ignorance. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's coming to law. That will be coming to you soon. And it will be a service offered on the channel. So coming to law, coming to law, coming to law. All right. With that being said, there is something we gotta we gotta go to Seattle. So give it a second, uh, ladies and gentlemen. There is something that we need to bring to y'all's attention. I am taking the time to do this video because I want to talk to you all about taxes. And that was me stretching. It is six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. Been up since four. And I, I, I got to my sleep. I was well rested. We want to show y'all something. So give me a second, please. Datamass.org. Ladies and gentlemen, I got a story I want to tell you. Okay, datamass.org. At the age of 15, I received my first job. St. Francis Medical Center. Maxine Nordis, the congresswoman. My mother's former best friend gave me that job. 
I've told you guys the story many times. I was working at a hospital, St. Francis Medical Center. I worked in a department of sterilization. It wasn't really sterilization. That wasn't the name of the department, but that's what I did. I sterilized all the medical equipment for the hospital. I worked about part-time, so it was four hours at a time every day, five days a week. It was part-time, but I got paid pretty good. Got paid well above minimum wage. Minimum wage was $4. I got paid, I believe it was $6 at the time for doing that job. Now, don't get me wrong. Maxine, she got paid too, <laughs> okay, for giving me the job. She took part of the salary, okay? But that, that was okay. I didn't mind because I agreed for a certain price. And because she got me the job, Okay, that was the way things worked, and I didn't did not mind, and to this day, it was not a problem. And here I am, 15 years old, and I'm working with equipment that could sterilize me for the rest of my life. So I had training. They did train me, and I didn't have any supervision. I was the only one down there. Nobody else in the room but me. That's not the first job where I'm put in charge of an entire department for the time that I'm there. And then after I would leave, there would be an adult who would come and relieve me of my job. And no problem, but that was a contract job, so it lasted only a year. The next job I got was the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, when that St. Francis job ended at the age of 16, I go to a tax preparer because my mother, I had to do my taxes and my mother told me I had to do my own taxes. She did not help me. But guess what? That was exactly the point. She was trying to teach me that I had to do things, that I had to learn things on my own. Everybody keeps coming to me asking me to help them with this and help them with that. People, I've never been taught that way. People pointed me in a direction, and I went in that direction. I had to learn for myself, just like in the court. When I first went in the court, I didn't have any help. There was no adult sitting up there helping me at the age of 15. Nobody came to my aid. I had to do that by myself. And as I told you, I was successful at the age of 15, 16, 17, and 18. There are a couple of times, uh, maybe twice, that the judge ruled against me, and I had to appeal it and won the appeal. Okay, never had a license so-called suspension or anything like that. But at the age of 16, I had just finished working for the year, and it was time to do my taxes. And so I go to a tax preparer. It's a neighborhood tax preparer. Um, the family had a family-owned business, and one of the sons did taxes. And everybody would go to him. Uh, later found out he was a crook. <laughs> would you know it but everybody went to the person who did the taxes and I remember keeping all my receipts because I knew something that nobody talks about today that I had to keep my receipts to show my expenses but you know when I showed him my receipts for my expenses he says oh no 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 I don't need that I said wait a minute I'm supposed to be able to write this stuff off he, oh well, no you can't do it like that what do you mean I can't do it like this I'm 15 years, I'm 16 years old at the time. And he tells me I can't write off my expenses. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm 16 years old. I know I can write off my expenses. Do you know why I know that? Because I told you I watch the news every single day. I was watching the financial report. I was listening to this information. I was going to the so-called training with Maxine Waters. I had to spend an hour after school every day and we went over taxes. I'm not joking. 15 years old, I'm reviewing tax law and having it explained. That's how I knew that the dependent is one capacity, the taxpayer is another capacity, the head of household is another capacity. Those are capacities. Those are not individuals. That I, the tax documents, used to list the word self in one of the dependents. Because you take care of yourself. How many of you have never written on your tax document that you are a dependent? That you take care of yourself? Go back and read the tax document. 
Does it not say, does anyone else claim you as a dependent? Pay attention. Does anyone else other than you claim you as a dependent? It's telling you right there. Wait, hold on. Let's do it. We're going to go to irs.gov. We're going to go to DS. What is that? Ah, I don't want 1040B. I want 1040. Let's do. No, that's a schedule one. I don't want. I just want the 1040. Okay, individual income tax return. You guys have seen that document before. This is not the first time you've seen it. So we're going to click on the PDF of the fillable document. And the reason why we're going to click on it, because we're going to show you exactly what it has always said. But what you didn't know is that used to be right here in parentheses off to the side, it would say self or here it would say self. And you would put yourself there. Now, hold on. Let's make sure you know. See, if more than four dependents, see instructions, blah, blah, blah. But we are looking here. Where is that? Give me one second. I'm looking for the box where it says, does anyone else claim you as a dependent? And it's usually in this section right here. Let's see. Ending. Nope, we don't need that. Qualified child. Nope, we don't need that. Single. See, I am single and I'm the head of household. Those are two separate capacities. If I was married, I would be married and head of household. Or if it was my wife and she was the head of the household, because that is the case, she could be. Now, look, standard deduction. Someone can claim you as a dependent. You. Someone can claim your spouse as a dependent. Her. If she takes care of herself and we're living in the same house. If she got a job and she is bringing on some revenue. That's what we learned, ladies and gentlemen. So I've always claimed three dependents. Now, people, the easiest way, this was at the time when me, myself, and I, de la so, it's just me, myself, and I. They, de la so wasn't stupid, people. They were telling you. Okay? Go back and listen to the lyrics of the song. Lord have mercy. Okay. So I am single. That's one dependent. I am the head of household and I am a dependent. That was three dependents. Now, there, technically, there are four. There are four. Technically, there are four, but I never went that far. There was one other dependent that you don't know about. The other dependent is the taxpayer. Pay attention. This is the taxpayer. That's another dependent. So that's four dependents. And guess what the IRS cannot do? They cannot argue with you. Because these are capacities. The law permits it. But some of you are not doing your taxes correctly. So, what we've suggested, and I'm hoping you all are paying attention, this company, Datamask, was created for you. One, for you to write off your taxes. But get your taxes done by your tax preparer first. Tell them you will file the document. That way they, they're not taking any liability. They're just filling in the numbers. And you will file the document later because you're going to be attaching statements to the document. And so you will get it filed. And you want to make sure that there's no other documents at home. So if you do, you'll bring it back home to have it uh, completed. But either way, you will file the documents with the Internal Revenue Department. Now, somebody asked me, will they do the K-1s and will they do this and will they do the 1099s? You have to contact Datamask. But they do K-1s. They do 1099s. They will complete the forms for you. They're not just adding credits. They're adding the forms where the credits are supposed to be added, where the deductions are supposed to be added. But the website says that. 
Nobody wants to read. Hey, this is a lot of work putting this site together. A lot of stress. So read the information as to what they do and how it is their job to apply the most appropriate documents for the situation. Now, I want to show you guys something. So I got to put you on pause in order to show you this. Give me a second. Almost hit the wrong button. So you're wondering, why do I need credits? Why do I need tax credits? What can tax credits do for me? 2019. Luis Reed, CPA. Let's pay attention to what's going on with Luis Reed. I took the time in taking this information and bringing it here. So let's hear what's going on with Luis uh, Louis Reed. This article is part of the occasional series Future Tech Today, which offers first-hand experiences from accounting firms, finance departments, and others putting cutting-edge technologies to work today. Three years ago, Richmond, Virginia-based accountant Louise W. Reed, CPA, knew little about blockchain. Today, she's launching a blockchain-based marketplace for tax credit transfers and looking to transition out of her traditional tax practice. Wait, hold on. What, what's she doing? Hold on. Wait, wait. Can you explain what she's doing again, please? She's launching a blockchain-based marketplace for tax credit transfers and... Wait, 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 wait. Tax credit transfers? She, she's going to be transferring tax credits? So, so you mean it, it just Eon making up something out of thin air that 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 it is a legitimate thing it can people can do this hold on what else and looking she to know? transition out of her traditional tax practice why the dramatic change wait a minute oh she's all of a sudden doing this now really interesting hold on. change this is her story a couple of years ago i attended a blockchain class at the cch connections conference there were eight people in the class and i Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. You attended the class? Oh. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, y'all don't know what a blockchain is. A blockchain is technically a program for trading cryptocurrency. Oh, you didn't understand. Cryptocurrency doesn't exist. Cryptocurrency is digital. It, it's only on a computer. Cryptocurrency does not exist. So when you understand that, you can understand what she's talking about. She's talking about using tax credits on a blockchain for trading, for transferring credits. Hold on. Interesting. Eh? Was the only CPA. I had no idea what I was walking into, but I have a master's degree in physics and something about the math behind blockchain spoke to me. Over the next year and a half, I became increasingly knowledgeable about blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and smart contracts. Wait, wait, wait. What is a smart contract? Well, basically, it's a contract that is utilized for trading cryptocurrency. There must be a smart contract in every transaction. And so it's a simple thing. It's not a it's not a real huge thing. But you guys saw when I was doing the chat GPT and having it create a blockchain. That's what I was doing. I, I haven't finished it. I've got so many other things. But hold on. I learned a lot at several different conferences. But it wasn't until I tried to help a friend sell five hundred thousand dollar worth of tax credits that I realized how blockchain. Wait, she, she, she. Wait, wait. Hold on. What would you do? Hold on. Let, let's find out what she did, y'all. I tried to help a friend sell five hundred thousand dollar worth of tax credits that. I... Whoa! She tried to help a friend sell five hundred thousand dollars worth of tax credits. Hmm. Tax credits can be bought and sold. Hold on. That I realized how blockchain could apply to accounting. See the sidebar. What is blockchain? You can't sell most tax credits, but some are legally transferable. Some states allow this to encourage certain types of behaviors. For no, no, hold on. Let's make sure you understand. You can sell tax credits. She's not talking. You see, there's certain things they're leaving out. You can sell carry forward tax credits. There's no law against that. You can transfer carry forward tax credits. There is no law against that. That's what she's not mentioning. Because they can't tell you everything because then everybody will be doing it. And then she wouldn't be able to make a good business out of it because everybody would be doing it. Hold on. For example, the Commonwealth of Virginia offers land preservation tax credits to landowners who agree not to develop their land. However, you can't use tax credits to get tax refunds. That is incorrect. 
you most certainly can use tax credits to get tax refunds. Okay, she knows that. I know that. The IRS will let you know. Pay attention. It's called refundable tax credits. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> so like I said, if you go by these articles, if you go by these artic uh, articles that they are writing and you just go by what they're saying, you will be misled, like Cool in the Gang said. Okay? You don't want to be misled. That's why Data Mask was created. Now, before you can learn how to transfer, sell, get a refund, you must have the credits in the first place. Everybody wants to put the cart ahead of the understanding, which don't make no sense. All I can say is, Lord, have mercy. So, hold on. Refunds. That's a problem for a lot of farmers and other landowners who owe little to no Virginia income tax. To address this, Virginia lets the landowners sell their tax credits to individual taxpayers with a Virginia income tax burden, who can buy these tax credits at a discount. Now, hold on. Now. You can sell them at a discount. That, that, that's okay. But here, because that's what we do. But here, here, pay attention. So you guys understand something. Because it's important that you understand this. She's talking about state law. <laughs> Hold on. She's not talking about federal. See, Virginia only allows you to transfer blah, 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 certain tax credits. But I guarantee you, go look at the law about transferable credits associated with, pay attention, carry forward credits. Now, let, 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 let's say a farmer has a lot of land. One second. Let, let, let's say that. Discount. Discount. Right, let's, say it. let's say that a farmer with a lot of land outside of Washington, D.C., decides to donate the land to a conservation trust, promising in perpetuity to preserve the land. After working with appraisers, lawyers, and the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, the farmer might have $800,000 worth of tax credits. At that point, the farmer would go to one of the larger CPA firms to help find a buyer for the credits. Because tax credits are typically bought and sold in bulk, the farmer usually wants a CPA with access to buyers with a lot of state income who would be willing to buy credits at a discount to offset their taxes, although any state taxpayer can use the credits to offset their state income tax. Any taxpayer can utilize the credits to offset their taxes. Now, child support is a tax. Restitution is a tax. You starting to understand? Property tax <laughs> is a tax. Okay, delinquent tax debts with the IRS is a tax. That's what the tax credits are for, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of people are in debt because they owe taxes. So, datamask.com. Hold on, let's go back to her CPA. My CPA firm is not big. I have 50 clients, but, as I mentioned before, I had a friend with $500,000 worth of tax credits to sell. I thought, this is fantastic. I can help him out, and one of my clients can buy tax credits at a discount. Unfortunately, personalities and emotions created a complicated situation. My friend wanted cash, but my client didn't want to reveal themselves to the seller. Because the two sides couldn't trust each other, the deal didn't get done. Ain't that interesting. $500,000 worth of tax credits would have benefited the other party tremendously, but because of his ignorance, he didn't go through with it. That's stupid. He would have bought it at a discount. He would have gotten rid of $500,000. Then he would have been able to write off the purchase price because it was a business transaction. And technically, he would have had $500,000 plus the transaction price, and credits. And he said no? Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm told it is what it does. I, I, I really am told that it is what it does. Hold on. When the tax credits situation happened with my friend, I immediately thought of blockchain. 
Because trading tax credits involves a lot of trust regarding the validity of the credits and the buyer having cash, an old boys network has developed around the buyers and sellers. Fewer buyers means fewer people a seller needs to trust, creating a necessity for buyers to buy credits in bulk and therefore to have enough cash to afford it. This creates an ecosystem of wealthy taxpayers and credit holders a very limited market. Because blockchain instills trust through its technology rather than individual people, it can help create a much larger market for tax credit transfers. Hey, she's right. I decided to set up a blockchain-based marketplace for tax credit transfers called Afloat. The project started last year. The first phase was finding the right team. I did a lot of learning and a lot of talking to people to see if they could do the project. This was not a straight path. Some people said no. I eventually went with programmers in Poland, Argentina, and New York and a guy in the Richmond area who is general counsel and project manager. For the past year, I have been trying to integrate this project into my life and phase out of my tax practice. It's really fun and exciting. Afloat is designed to democratize tax credit trades, enabling any taxpayer with cash to buy credits from sellers. Anyone familiar with the bid-ask spread of the stock market will also be familiar with Afloat setup. Buyers and sellers put in transparent limit orders, and the blockchain takes care of the rest, such as verifying the credits and ensuring payment. Say you have a tax client who could benefit from about $2,000 worth of tax credits on their state return. You can send the client an invitation. After they log in, they will see a dynamic chart showing who has put in a limit order. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me explain. That's what Datamask does. It does your taxes so that when you do finally get your transcripts, you will have documentation of your credits. Okay. From the IRS. And once you have documentation of your credits, now the credits are verified from the IRS, not from some blockchain. Now, if the blockchain idea is perfect because they have smart contracts, and the smart contracts is verification. But most of your common folk don't know about smart contracts and how blockchains work and how they work to verify. That's why cryptocurrencies being exchanged on a market on a blockchain is safer than so many other transactional situations. Ladies and gentlemen, I took the time to explain to you about what I knew at the age of 16. What I, and this is the article right here, what I suspected everybody else knowing. Nobody else knew it. That didn't make any sense. That nobody else knew that they got to write off their expenses. It's right there in the code. It's right there in the law. I knew at the age of 16 that the government was supposed to be taking care of people to the point where when I turned, how old was I? I think I was 25 years old. I decided to go and stay in a homeless shelter. And I stayed there for three weeks. Because I wanted to know what the homeless lived like. Because here's the country land of the free home with a so-called brave, and they were supposed to be providing opportunities for people. So I said, well, let me see if they're taking care of their people. And I found out that the homeless, not only do they get three squares and a cot, but they get clothing allowances. They get food. Not only do they get the soup kitchens, Okay, but they also get something else. They get food stamps in the form of an EBT card, and then they also get cash. Because most states have generally not, not a lot of money, but they don't have to pay rent because there is a shelter as long as they comply with the dumb rules. And the rules are dumb. You have to be in at a certain time, usually by 7 to 9 p.m. You have to be on the property. Yes, 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 they could feel like jail to some people, but they have a place to sleep at night. Their clothes get washed. They get a place to take a shower. They get a place to eat breakfast. They get a place to eat dinner. And they have soup kitchens to eat lunch. I learned this. I would ask questions. Hmm. That made sense. But what I can't understand on this day is that all of these people have the right, the option, the opportunity to write off their debts. And people haven't been doing it. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
Datamask. Datamask was created to take care of that need because nobody else is doing this for the people. No one else. See, if the government could tax the people on their labor, then that would mean that the people work at the grace or with the permission of government. Government can't tax you on your labor. How can they tax you on your exchange, your medium of exchange? Your labor is your money. Oh, if you didn't understand, money is a medium of exchange. When you go to an employer and you say, hey, look, you need this done, so I'll exchange my labor for money. As Usher would say, I will work for money. Well, he said he will work for love, but you know, same thing. Ladies and gentlemen, your labor is your medium of exchange. It's your money. The government has no jurisdiction over your money. Your labor is your money. You're being taxed on your labor. They cannot tax you on your labor. The Constitution doesn't allow that. It's called your right to life or your right to live or your right to earn a living. living. Your right to earn a live. You have the right to live. In. Okay, continuously. Ongoing. Your right to life. There's nothing in the Constitution that envisioned an income tax. That's why income tax only applies to commerce, because Congress only gets the authority to regulate commerce. Your labor is not commerce. Don't tell nobody. Your labor is not income. Income is anything over and above your labor. What is, oh, sorry, we got one more thing, and then I'm going to let you guys go, because I can't keep telling you all this stuff, because we're just going to have some problems. People are going to be like, Mama, I don't believe him because he said that uh, they can't tax us on our labor. So we got iOS tax topic 453, and it, it's right here. I don't know why I didn't just click here because it's right there, but we're going to click right there because I like the way they do that right there. Oh, that's the wrong form. Oh, that's the form that tells you about non-business, bad debt, where people get to write off their taxes. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention. <laughs> To prove to you that they cannot tax you on your labor. We don't want to be a cash method taxpayer. That's why that's voluntary. You want to be a cash method taxpayer, that's voluntary. If you are a cash method taxpayer, and most individuals, individual taxpayers, <laughs> okay, most people are, you generally can't take a bad debt deduction on unpaid wages, salaries, rent fees, interest, dividends, and Similar items of taxable income. They just told you you can take a deduction on taxable income. Ain't that interesting? Well, don't they consider wages and salaries taxable income? Ain't that something? Don't they consider rents and fees as taxable income? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to work and them charging you for work, such as Social Security and Medicaid, that's taxable income. So you can take a deduction if you are doing the correct math. And let's say it again, because some of y'all don't understand, and I understand that y'all don't understand, so I'm going to do you a favor. That's what data mass is there for. Data mass. So, ladies and gentlemen, all you have to do, first page, Click apply now. Uh oh. Oh, snap. I got to change that. Haha. <laughs> Sorry. You can't click apply now. I got to go change that today. Uh -huh. That's because <clears throat> I had to relabel the pages. So I apologize. You're going to click on product. But I will be taking care of that by the time this video is up. So you will be able to click on apply now. All right. And you will. The payment. And after you do the payment, you will come back to this page. That's what this says right here. Remember, after you select the payment, you will come back to this page and fill out the form. And you'll fill out the form as best you can. And then they will get in touch with you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, give me one quick second. Okay, as I told you guys, by the time this video is up, the link would be fixed. When you click on it now, it takes you directly to the page. It was a simple fix. It's just, like I said, I changed the 
location of the pages. And when I did that, I forgot to go and change that one link. So this is it uploading right now, uh, finishing and completing. Ladies and gentlemen, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and let you all get back to your day. As I tell people, if I could do the things I was doing at the age of 15, 16 years old, I can't understand why other people are having such a hard time doing the same thing at 50, 70 years old. It is mind boggling. But, and I wasn't, yeah, technically I was somewhat exceptional according to some people, but it, it wasn't that exceptional. All right, I gotta go. I have a consult at 10.30, so I have three hours and I'm bringing over the new dog today. So I have to go take care of these things. We will speak to you guys at another time. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, as we stated, as I stated, Data Mask was created for you all. You individuals who are receiving tax credits, who have tax credits, who don't know what to do with your tax credits, go and review the site and see what it offers. See how it helps you. See how it takes care of your tax credits, your write-off, your charge-offs, and your deductions. Because your CPAs won't do it. You saw how I just showed you that particular CPA is not telling you everything. Now, they will not engage in answering your questions because they're not there to answer your questions. Data Mass is not there to answer your questions. They are not there to explain what they're doing. They're there just simply to provide the service. As all of the organizations I've ever created, they're a service-based organization. They're just there to provide a service. The information on the website is designed to help you come to a better understanding. This lets you know about exemptions, right to work, taxes and estates, products about them, and so on and so forth. This is designed to give you your education. There are even simple stories that they tell you. And this is a case from 1969. This is a Judge Grimes of the Supreme Court delivering the opinion of the court in this 69 case. Still, I believe it was a Dodge Dart that the case was dealing with. And Judge Grimes talked about how private property, your household goods, consumer goods, are non-taxable. And he talked about it being a foundational, fundamental law in the United States. So how come you guys are believing a presumption? Remember, if you understood anything about presumption of law, whoever brings the presumption does not have the burden of proving the presumption. You have to disprove a presumption. And if you don't disprove it, then it becomes the law with you. I disprove presumptions because I can't live by presumptions. I can only live by facts. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a very good day.